Hello Year 7 and welcome to Lesson 2 of the Timeline of Language and Literature Unit. Lesson 2 is largely all about invasions and in this lesson we're going to have a look at different invaders that brought different languages to England to result in what we now recognise as the English language. To start, here's a little challenge. This links into um, last lesson, very much so. I want you to tell me what these cars have got in common. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about the fact that they're all cars or the fact that they've got four wheels or etc. etc. It's something to do with their names. So I want you to have a look at um, the names of these cars. The Toyota on the right, by the way, is... It's not the Toyota I'm looking for, it's the name of that particular model, which is still around, but it's more of a kind of uh, like 90s model. So you might need to ask your parents what that is, but they've all got something in common and it's something to do with their names. Once you've worked out what they've got in common, you can write your answer on the form in Google Classroom. So leading on from last lesson, we know in 55 BC there was an invasion by the Romans into England and the Romans brought us Latin. The Romans, as you will probably know, gave Latin names to places and some of these names are still used today. For example, places with the word Chester um, in them are derived from the Roman name for camp. So thinking about places ending in Chester... Your next job on the worksheet in Google Classroom is to type in, try and think of four different places that have Chester in the name. So as we're talking about invasions, here are a few questions about Roman soldiers and associated language. So the first question that you need to fill in on your form Roman soldiers were called Millites. Millites. Which English words can you think of that are clearly derived from this word? So which English words can you think of that are clearly related to? They come from the same place. They are derived from the same place as Millites. Write down your answers. Next question. Roman soldiers were given a salt ration as payment. Did you know that? And that was called a salarium. What modern word is derived from this word? So what word that we use today is derived from salarium? And it's not, it's not celery, although it's not far off. Finally, Roman soldiers called their kit impedimento. Impedimento. Why do you think this was? So I want you to write down your explanation of this word. Now you should remember that that prefix im, you should remember what that means from talking about this last term. So if you've got im or in at the start of a word, remember what it means. So um, inactive or impossible. So what does im mean? And then think about the word impediment you might know. Any lawful impediment you might mention or not at a wedding. And then think about pedi. Where do you hear um, that root, pedi? What might you have done if you are into your health and beauty regimes? So what might impedimento mean and this refers to the kit that they had to carry and have a look at the man on the left to see why they might have called it that so last lesson in this lesson we've had a brief stop with the romans we've had a look at the effect that their invasion had on the language we speak in our country and now we're going to move forward in time so we're going from bc forward to the fifth century ad because as we will come to see language in our country the language that we call english has been changed 
mainly in the early days at least because of invasion after invasion. And the invasion we're looking at now is that of the Germanic tribes. There were three tribes who invaded Britain during the 5th century AD and they were the Angles, the Jutes and the Saxons and they crossed over to England, they crossed the North Sea from what today is Denmark and northern Germany. So that's why they're called Germanic tribes. So when the Angles, the Saxons and the Jutes invaded, at that time, the people in Britain spoke um, what's called Celtic language. But after the invasion, most of those Celtic speakers were pushed west and north by the invaders. So your question is, looking at this map on the right, where were most of those Celtic speakers pushed? Where did they have to move to? So I want you to write a list of places where those Celts would have moved to. The Angles language was called English, but it wasn't spelt the same way as modern English, nor did it sound the same way that modern English does. As you can see from the spelling, rather than SH at the end, you've got SC. But SC can still make the SH sound, so rather than reading Inglisk, we can read English. Your job now on the form is to write down a couple of words that you can think of in the English language that also have SC, usually in the middle of the word, but that when SC makes a SH sound. So I'm looking for words that contain SC that make a SH sound in that word. The English language has, um, since its very beginning, been constantly growing and changing. So we know already that the language spoken in the country we now call England has changed due to invasions um, and it continued to grow and to change during the years following those invasions when people settled down and moved into places where they were going to stay. Old English, which is also called Anglo-Saxon, is an early form of the English language that was spoken and written in parts of what are now England and southeastern Scotland between 550 AD and 1100 AD. So what we're going to do now is have a look at some Old English, which is the very earliest form of the language that we come to recognise as English. We're going to have a look at a piece of text that you might not recognise initially, but you might recognise it shortly. Here is an example of Old English. So your job now is to have a look through carefully, see if you can spot any words that are familiar to you. Can you recognise any of these words? And then on the form, write down any of those words that you can recognise. So as you can see, there are some recognisable words in Old English. And the Anglo-Saxons, as time went on, the Angles and the Saxons settled into the country, um, set up their homesteads, and there was a, a period of relative peace in terms of external invasions. Um, the language used at this time is really interesting, the development of certain words that are still around today. For example, cow, house, bread, and sword. So your next question on the form, your next question is, what do these words, all four of them, I want you to think about, what do these four words, cow, house, bread, and sword, suggest about life for the typical Anglo-Saxon family? What do the words cow, house, bread, and sword suggest about life for the typical Anglo-Saxon family. Now, as we know, as an island state, nothing stayed quiet for long. And sure enough, invasion after invasion, the next one 
came along. And this time, from the countries in the peach colour, in the top right of the map, Norway, Sweden and Denmark. As we know, this group of people, this group of invaders, were called the Vikings. From about 800, the Vikings started to invade Britain. Um, they spoke in a language that later developed into Norwegian and Danish. And while they were in England, they left behind many words that we still use today. Uh, for example, you, which fascinates me. What did we use before that? You, husband, law and anger. And also place names were just as in the Roman times, place names were influenced by the Vikings and the language that they brought with them. So Tenby and Grimsby, the B bit, the BY bit means village. So your next question is on the form, can you think of any local place names that end in B? So any places in Norfolk that end in B? Um, write them down and if you can, guaranteed, they will have been named as a result of the invasion of the Vikings. The following question on the form asks you to think about in the same way that we made some, uh, we drew some conclusions about the Anglo-Saxons based on the words that they left us with, like house, cow, bread and sword. What conclusions can we draw about the Vikings based on the words that they left us with? So you, husband, law and anger. What conclusions can we draw about the Vikings from those words? from those additions to our language. So far then, we have established that language in our country was changed and developed by Roman invasions, Anglo-Saxon invasions, Viking invasions, and I did tell you, invasion after invasion, there is finally the invasion from the French. So in 1066, I want you to tell me who is pictured on the left. That's the next question on your form. Who is pictured on the left? And he was part of an invasion by the French in 1066. And once you've written down his name, which you should all be shouting out loud at this point, I then want you to have a think about what do we already know? about the roots of the French language. So think back to last lesson. What do we already know about where the French language came from? And then the follow up question is, how do we think, therefore, how do we think that the French invasion might impact the English language? So what do we already know about the roots of the French language and how might the French invasion influence the English language. The language that was used in England after the French invasion was called Middle English. So this Middle English developed from Old English and it developed and changed slowly between about 1100 and 1500 AD. So during that period of time, new words were added, spelling changes were made, and a lot of those changes we owe to the French because much of that time period was spent under French rule in England. So this extract here is an example of Middle English. So there now should be more recognisable words. So your next job is go back to the form, have a look at this extract, now write down, it's the exact same text as it was before in Old English. But I want you to now write down any more words that you can now recognise. And there should be a fair few more that are recognisable in comparison to the language that you speak today. So write down any words from this extract that are recognisable English words. So, nous sommes arrivés. We have arrived. The egg in the middle of the flower, that's an analogy for what happened with the invasion of the French. With the arrival of the French, French became the language of the court, of government, of schools, of nobility. So French was everywhere. 
the church retained Latin, so the church still spoke Latin, um, used Latin. But there were two ways the Latin words were pouring into the English language. So firstly, through the Latin language of the church, and secondly, through the French words of the invaders. So that egg in the middle of that flower is a whole massive drop of new words and new phrases and new sounds into the language that already existed. And what happened was, if you put a whisk in there and mix it all up together, that development, that dropping in of all of that huge bulk of new language resulted in what we recognise more and more as modern English. There were more than 10,000 Latinate words um, that were added to the lexicon of English people, to, to the vocabulary of English people, and 75% of them are still being used today. So of the words that people were using over a thousand years ago, we are still using those same words today. And they came across the sea into our country from France. So before we do the final activity, I want to explain to you about tier one, tier two and tier three words. So some of you will have heard about this from your teachers before, but if you haven't, this is what it means. So all of the words that you use on a day to day basis can be grouped into tiers with three being at the top, the highest tier. Tier one at the bottom, and that's the biggest tier. These are the words that we use every day that are totally familiar to us. So words that we use in our speaking and in our writing, things like um, walking, coach, run, speech, tea, dog, etc. So straightforward words that we are almost instantly familiar with. Tier two words are words that are slightly more complex, but more precise. And we're usually familiar with them, but we don't tend to use them as often. For example, tier one, if you wanted to describe someone's emotion, you might say using a tier one word that they are sad. Tier two becomes more precise. So what kind of sadness are we talking about? Then you might have the word miserable. You might have the word dejected. Um, you might have the word lonesome. So tier one are the straightforward words that get straight to the point um, in a general way. Tier two, they're much more precise. So they're really looking precisely at exactly what you're trying to say. Tier three words are words that are specific to a certain subject or topic. So for example, a tier three word, as it says there, would be photosynthesis. You would usually only use that word photosynthesis if you were talking about the, pro the process of photosynthesis itself in science. And there are other words that you'll recognise that you would only use in certain subjects. If you used it elsewhere, it wouldn't make sense. It, it needs to be in its surroundings. Now, the, ones, uh, the words that we're going to look at now are tier one and tier two words. So... I'll take you through the task. So here we are. We're going to have a look at Anglo-Saxon imports. So words that were imported, brought in from Anglo-Saxon areas versus French imports. So words that were brought in from the French, from a Latinate background. And if you have a look, what we have done for you in the first column are the English words that are classed as tier one words. These are straightforward, everyday, general terms for things that most people would understand. So we've got motherly, go down, drink, high, sad, speed up, watch, hate, do again, die, hide, do well. So they're the tier one words. Now they come from, if you have a look in the second column, all of those words derive from, they come from the Anglo-Saxon words. So you've got modor, which was mother, modor, modor, um, gan, gan, ganning down, gan, which is go down, drinkan, hair, side, 
spoen, waken, hette, don ongen, dayen, hayden, and don well. I like hayden. <laughs> it's anyway. So they're your tier one English words that derive directly from Anglo-Saxon words. So these are the simple general words that we all understand. Now, if you have a look at the third column, these are words that were imported to us from the French. So they have Latin roots. And these words, interestingly enough, are the ones from which we get our tier two English words. So when we want to be more precise, rather than saying motherly, as in the Anglo-Saxon modor, we would say maternal which comes from the French Latin maternus. In the example where you've got miserable here, miserable is a more specific tier two word for sad, which is the tier one word given to us by the Anglo-Saxons. And then the final example of giving you die in English tier one comes from the Anglo-Saxon de dien, um, now, in the English tier two word, you can see rather than die, we've got expire, which is far more precise because it still implies death, but it implies an ending. It, it implies something that is no longer um, breathing, as it were. And that comes directly from the French Latin expirare. So your job is to see if you can fill in the final column with the tier two English word. So like in the three examples, I want you to fill in the gaps. So if we have a look at the second row then, English tier one, we would say go down, go down those stairs. The Anglo-Saxons would have said gan down the stairs or gan, gan the stairs. The French would have said descender. What is the English tier two word from descender that means to go down? So work your way through the table, fill in the gaps on Google Classroom in the form and your job is done.